So good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, Sebastian, for the uh, introduction. So it's a pleasure to be here. And, um, and my task in the following four, four lecture slots is basically to, to introduce you to the, to the technique called um, exact diagonalization. So um, as you can see from the title slide, so it will be basically about uh, solving the, the Schrodinger equation in various forms for various quantum many-body systems. And I will tell you a, a lot of different aspects to it and also what, what you can actually do with this technique, which, which might be interesting for many applications. So the, the plan of the four uh, slots of the lectures is um, to start now and give you some some first introduction to exact diagonalization and explaining basically what, what are the ingredients, what is the technique about, what can you roughly do with it, just in an overview in a sense, and then start um, understanding dif different parts of, um, of what you actually need to, to understand in order to write a, a performant um, exact diagonalization code yourself. Then in the second part today, um, I will continue, um, and then the uh, symmetries. Of a, of a Hamiltonian, which you want to use in your in your exact diagonalization approach, will be important. And also, with, with exact diagonalization, you can also do um, real time and frequency dynamics using some um, clever approaches. And that's also something I'm, I'm going to to explain to you. <coughs> then the the lecture tomorrow in the morning is a bit more about uh, physics application. And so something that what exact diagonalization is quite good at is actually to do uh, spectroscopy, meaning um, resolving spectra of quantum anybody systems by various quantum numbers, which you can, um, which are um, connected to symmetries, for example. So, for, for example, you can plot many body spectra as a function of of, um, of momentum, which is. Uh, the quantum number um, related to translation symmetries, for example, and similarly for, rot for lattice rotations or for, for SU2 symmetry, which some of the quantum spin models have. And actually, it turns out that this is not just um, a useful thing to just get benchmark energies to compare to other methods, but there's actually a lot of f physical understanding you can extract from uh, just looking at the, at the many-body energy spectrum. And that would basically show you in a few uh, applications what you can actually do with that. And, and sometimes this allows you to understand things which are hard to grasp um, using other methods, even though they might work on substantially larger systems. But to actually get a rather complete account of the energy spectrum of a quantum anybody system is something which I, I think only exact diagonalization is able to do um, on, a, on an efficient level. And then uh, tomorrow in the afternoon, we'll have um, some tutorial session, which might be a, a combination of, of doing an, app, an ALPS um, application, where there is an exact diagonalization code, as you probably have heard. So you can either do that, or um, <coughs> we, can, we can implement some uh, time-dependent um, simulation using some uh, Krilov techniques, which is uh, also a nice illustration of what you can do using some of these linear algebra tricks. <coughs> so the so um, in contrast to many other methods, the main idea of exact diagonalization is rather quickly uh, told. It's basically um, you want to, to solve the Schrödinger equation of a quantum many money system numerically. So that's the Schrödinger equation here, the stationary one, time in independent one. And you, you just try to do that as efficiently and as, as um, fast as possible. Um, and so as we will see in many, in many applications, the, if you choose a clever basis of your quantum anybody system, then actually this, um, the, ba the matrix H um, is uh, sparse, which means it does not have a substantial number of entries per column or per, per row. But, um, but for quantum anybody systems, the, the Hilbert space, the vector space, uh, which you keep working, grows exponentially with, with the number of, of um, spins or qubits or, or whatever. I mean, I guess this is well known, but this is a, a serious limitation at, at first. And, um, and so some people actually think that exact realization can be limited to that. You're just doing um, energy, kind of calculating some, some eigenvalues. But there's a lot more to the technique in order to really make it into a powerful tool. So it's not just, not just a benchmark technique, but, but an, a useful technique for its own um, sake. <clears throat> yeah, because if, if you, are, you, you can get um, a lot of physical information out of a finite system, and in the end, actually, by 
since you also have access to the full wave function and, and several wave functions, like in the low-lying energy spectrum, it's really a, a, a quite, quite a useful quantum mechanics toolbox because you, could, you can really do a lot of kind of numerical experiments and extract a lot of information from your finite system. And for, for many applications, not for all of them, but for many applications, it's actually, um, you can extract uh, kind of relevant physics already from, from the available system sizes. <coughs> There are also, also problems which are too challenging, but still there, there is a lot to be, to be done even, even nowadays. So as a kind of a first um, a glimpse of, of how um, a vector space or the Hilbert space really grows, let, let us look at um, a simple quantum anybody system, a spin system here on some lattice with, um, with two basis states per site, I'd say spin up or spin down. And, um, and then, as you know, the Hilbert space overall without any constraints grows, as a, grows exponentially. So 2 to the n in, in that case, where n is the number of sites. Um, and then if you do the cal calculation, so if you have 10 spins, which is <coughs> um, yeah, already some, some number, the Hilbert space amounts to roughly 1,000 um, uh, states. And if you go to 20 spins, um, it's a million. And then for 30 spins, it's about a billion, and so on. And for example, for 50, you're already at 10 to the whatever 15. <clears throat> so it's really a, a, a huge um, Hilbert space. And the question is, yeah, what, what can you actually uh, do? So where, where are the, the current um, uh, kind of records? And actually, using um, um, symmetry reductions, as we will talk about, and also using uh, parallelization techniques to actually do this um, iterations of your uh, matrix vector multiplications on a highly parallel machine, we're actually currently um, able to go close to, to 50 spins. So we can actually solve um, subspaces or, or assemble the Hilbert space by working in subspaces so we, that we get information of ground states of, of, um, of a problem with about 50 spins. So 48 spins ha have been done, um, and, and, um, and I think 50 or 52 spins are, are within reach for certain problems. So that tells you roughly where, where one could, can go. And, um, and I mean, 50, 50 spins, that's something where like 20 years ago people were doing or, uh, quantum Monte Carlo for that. So now we can do ED, but okay, it's in an exponentially scaling method, so we cannot expect to, to do 100 spins in the near future either. But still, there is some um, uh, progress on that side as well. And so basically, we would like to, to know the, the quantum mechanical wave function, and that is a vector in this Hilbert space. Um, and we would we, we like to know the ground state of a certain Hamiltonian, and perhaps um, a few of the low-lying eigenstates. So that's one, one field of application, is somehow to go for, for ground states or low energy properties. In that case, you're uh, obviously only interested in the ground state in a few excited states. That gives you kind of access to the low temperature physics. Um, in some other cases, you're actually interested to, to do thermodynamics, or, or if you're interested, say, in many-body localization, you also want to know a lot of, of information about states anywhere in the spectrum or at some finite energy density. And then, then we're not able to actually completely diagonalize um, a problem of that size. So if you're interested in 50, around 50 spins, we can only calculate the, the absolute ground states and the few of the excited state, but it's not possible to calculate all eigenstates. So that's, that's, not, that's not the case. If you're interested in, in calculating all the eigenstates or, or some eigenstates in the middle of the spectrum, you have, have roughly have to divide the system size in number of, of particles or sites by, by two. So if you want to do full diagonalization or, or some more elaborate technique to, to target states in the inner of the spectrum, you roughly are, um, say, uh, between 20 and 30 spins, but more on the 20 side, to, to give you an idea if you want to have everything, um, all eigenfunctions or, or the, the, the complete spectrum. Um, then might be interesting also as a motivation to see a bit in what, what fields exact diagonalization is applied. So one, um, one uh, field where it plays an important role still is um, our quantum magnets. <coughs> um, so mostly spin a half magnets, but also magnets with, with larger spin. And, um, and the reason is that, as we have seen, that's basically since they have um, one of the smaller Hilbert spaces per, per site, um, it's actually possible to do the largest systems in terms of lattice sites in the end. And then what one can do quite well using exact diagonalization is to characterize 
the, the nature of novel phases. Some things, you, you, for example, spin-nematic phases, which some time ago have not been really um, appreciated. But, but these are, are phases which you can diag diagnose very well using, using exact angularization. <clears throat> Actually, because of its um, spectral properties, that you can calculate energy spectra quite, um, quite efficiently, you, you can also learn a lot about uh, cr critical points in one dimension. So some of the quantum critical points have, have conformal symmetry. And, um, and then there is a lot of, of kind of field theory knowledge about that. And then you, you can actually see a lot of these appearing in, in energy spectra of finite size system. And so ED has been very um, useful in obtaining that. And also they have some um, track record in, in doing calculating dynamical uh, correlation functions in one and two spatial dimensions. By dynamical correlation functions, I mean something like um, a dynamical spin structure factor or some photo emission spectral function, which is uh, closely related to experimental um, um, techniques, such as inelastic neutron scattering or, or photo, photo emission. And I will tell you a little bit how to, how co how to calculate these, um, also using um, some linear algebra tricks. <clears throat> then some, um, some other field of application are, are fermionic models. So that these are Hubbard or TJ models, um, where you can cal calculate um, um, gap sparing properties and also uh, correlation exponents in one dimension. <clears throat> then it also has been used a lot in the, in the field of the fraction quantum Hall effect, so some topological state of, of matter, which... Um, where the Hamiltonian is, is slightly more, more complicated than a, uh, just a, a spin Hamiltonian because it typically has, has like four body interactions or six, six body interactions for some uh, model Hamiltonians. Um, and then you, using these techniques, you can again calculate energy related properties like energy gaps, but you can also calculate overlaps with, with model states, which play an important role in that field, and also entanglement spectra. So these are um, spectra of reduced density matrices of wave functions, they can be obtained using, using this technique. <clears throat> then also something which is popular are, are so-called uh, constrained models, where the, the Hilbert space is not just a plain a tensor product of a local Hilbert space. So, so say the spin chains I have to, um, told you about briefly, they are, they are the Hilbert space is a tensor product of, of a spin a half. Um, degrees of freedom, but sometimes you're interested in, in what, they, what we call constrained models, and so these can be quantum dimer models um, or um, anionic, anionic chains. And a quantum dimer model is a, is a model, you might have heard about it already, is a, a model where basically you know, the degree of freedom is, um, is, is kind of, um, um, is that each side um, actually has an outgoing uh, part of a dimer, and then, then a valid configuration basically means that each site has an outgoing dimer and it matches an, uh, another one um, from a neighboring site, which basically means that all, all the, the, all, each site is part of a dimer and, uh, and connects two sites together. And if you think about that, that's not the Hilbert space, which is, a, uh, which is, fact, which is a tensor product of local Hilbert spaces, but because there are these constraints which are non-on-site, non, non so they're non-local in the sense that there are constraints on the level of two of, of a bond um, or some environment of a spin. And also um, some of the um, what we call anion chains. So anions are, are um, excitations which are neither bosons or, or fermions. And people have thought about um, writing down interacting models of, of anions. Um, and they also have the property that somehow their, their local Hilbert space is not an integer. Um, for something can be something like square root of two. And if you try to write down a, a many-body Hilbert space of such a, a chain of anions, it actually also turns out you can, at least for some of them, you can write down as a, as a constrained Hilbert space. For example, for, for some of the, the Fibonacci anions, you can actually write that Hilbert space as a, um, where locally it can be like a, um, up or down. But, but then you have the constraints that no two, no two, para, no two neighboring spins can be simultaneously in the up state. So there's some local constraint of that kind. And then the overall Hilbert space also has these constraints. And then it, it scales um, with, a, with a smaller um, kind of um, um, quantum dimension as, as two, because you, you, you project out some of the states. E each time there are two neighboring ups, you, you discard them from your Hilbert space. And that's something which in exact angularization is not a fundamental problem. You just use a, a different method to generate your Hilbert space. But once the Hilbert space is there, you, you can work with your Hamiltonian in that basis, and you can apply the other techniques. Whereas in, 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 um, 
In other approaches, for example, in matrix product state methods or also in quantum Monte Carlo, it typically requires additional work to, to really get these, these um, uh, more complex Hilbert spaces to work. It's sometimes possible, but it's, not, it's often not a routine thing to do. <coughs> Um, then perhaps you have heard about it. There is, a, um, there is also a method called um, full, con full CI, full configuration interaction in quantum chemistry. So if you're doing that without any approximation, then as far as I know, this is called really fu full CI. And that's basically doing a um, um, similar thing as, as doing exact ionization for a Hubbard model. It's just that in quantum chemistry, the ha Hamiltonian is not the Hubbard model, but it, it has the same type of Hilbert space. So you have orbitals with spin up and spin down fermions in it and can also be doubly occupied. It's just that the Hamiltonian uh, somehow is a, a four fermion interaction which couples different orbitals together, but, but otherwise it's, it's comparable to a Hubbard, a Hubbard type um, Hamiltonian. Um, and also some people do use um, techniques very close to the philosophy of exact angularization also in the, in, for nuclear structure. So where you, you want to, you have two body and three body interactions among nucle nucle nucleons and you want to understand the energy spectrum of nuclei, then, then you can use similar techniques to, um, to do that. And also something which appeared um, in the last few years as well, is that one can actually also try to, do, to, to simulate quantum field theories which, so there was a, a recently a paper um, out a few, a few months ago where people actually um, did um, a Hilbert space truncation study of, say, the phi to the four theory in one plus one dimension. They actually start with a, with a, a massive uh, phi squared, a massive scalar field, and then you, you write down the Hilbert space formally, and then you truncate it at some energy level, and then you, you put the phi to the four interaction um, in it. And this is actually an interesting complementary approach to, say, um, the usual lattice discretization, because you actually write down your field theory on a finite volume, but not on a lattice in the continuum, and then you truncate in energy space, and this is a complementary way to do it. And then if you actually think about how that Hilbert space is organized and, and, and so on, then it actually is, is very close to, to, um, to exact angularization also for some, some other models, like comparable to this fraction quantum hall or this these um, full CI techniques for quantum chemistry. So that's quite close, and perhaps one can also make progress um, in understanding so some of the open questions in that, in that field as well. <coughs> so are, are there questions so far? I, I mean, I, I, I encourage you to actually ask questions also. On the, so it, this is supposed to be a school, so um, I'm looking forward for this event to be interactive. So if you have questions or or so just do not hesitate to, to interrupt me and, and ask. Now, um, so let, let us have a look to, um, to show you a bit what is, what is possible. What are um, kind of system sizes in terms of spins or, and lattices, what, what people have been able to, to study in the, in the, in the literature. So if you start with the, with the larger systems, because they kind of have the smallest Hilbert space per size, these are these um, spin one half, uh, spin chain, or spin, spin lattice models. So in, in the literature, you, you can find results for, um, for about 40 spins uh, square lattice. So, so obviously, the 40 spins are in total. So this is not a 40 by 40 lattice, but really 40, 40 spins overall volume. And then you can find results for, for 39 side triangular lattice, 42 side honeycomb lattice. And there's also this, this simulation with 48 side um, Kagomi lattice, which are, which are possible. Um, and so these, these uh, numbers, here, which I document here, they are basic for a, for a spin model with, with um, a C conservation, which means that they have that the SAC component, the overall SC component is conserved. And, um, and also they, these lattices have translation symmetry. So you can use these symmetries to reduce the, the block with which you're looking at. And, um, and also the, the magnetization sector, so the AC um, is, um, is zero, which means that you're, you're looking at the system um, half-filled half in boson language. That's typically where the Hilbert space is, um, is um, largest. If you, if you, however, change the filling, so either to change the magnetization or change the, the filling in terms of, of hardcore bosons, then obviously the Hilbert space is, is smaller if you're at higher magnetization or, or lower magnetization than, than zero. And um, then you can go larger and then you, you can easily do like an eight by eight lattice 
in elevated magnetization. And if you're in really interested in few particle physics, for example, four particles or something, then you can easily go to probably 100 or 200 sites because then the Hilbert space is, um, is, some, um, is some combinatorical factor, but you're only putting four particles on a large lattice that grows only like the fourth power um, of, your, of your volume, whereas if you're kind of working at constant filling, then your, your, um, your Hilbert space grows exponentially. So, so if you're interested in few body physics, you can actually do, um, obviously, problems on really large lattices. <clears throat> and to give you, um, because over in the end, at the end of the day, what really matters um, in, most, in most of the cases is the, the, the Hilbert space in, a, in the particular block you're, you're considering, the one which you really, you need to allocate memory in order to do um, linear algebra operations. So which means that after symmetry reduction, um, the largest simulations which have been reported basically use uh, 500 billion basis states. So 500 billion is 5 times 10 to the 11. So that's the, the Hilbert space, or the, ve the vector size of your Hilbert space block which you are, are considering. And if you translate that in terms of memory, you, you realize that then even a single vector in that Hilbert space uses several terabytes of memory. So this gives you an idea of what, what the cutting edge um, um, linear algebra prob problems were, in what kind of dimensions they're, they're working. Yeah. yeah, we will talk about that l later in the lecture. I will tell you some strategies to parallelize the code. Um, so, I mean, for, for some applications, I mean, actually, there are, there are shared memory machines which have, like, 16 terabytes of memory. So if you have access to such a machine, you, you don't have to worry too much. You can do some, some op open MP parallelization. But, but the, the, the things which actually scales better is to really chunk your Hilbert space and distribute it over several different nodes which do not have shared memory. But then you have to think how, to, how these um, different uh, tasks communicate with each other, and, and you have to think about the parallelization strategy and how they communicate efficiently. But this can be done. It, it's, it's some work, but it, it can be done. And then you're actually distributing your, your Lanzos vectors over, say, 1,000 or 10,000 different MPI processes. And, and okay, and you, 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 don't, you, you need several vectors instead of only one. Yeah, typically you need two or three or four, depending whether you use real arithmetics or complex arithmetics, or whether you, you're going for a ground state wave function or just a ground state energy. Uh, then the, you typically need between two and four vectors. <coughs> yeah, then the in the context of the fraction quantum Hall effect. Um, there you have, have um, filling fractions, but, but typically you can do um, 16 to 20 electrons. So in the fraction quantum Hall effect, at least in, this, in the simplest uh, problems, the electrons are spin polarized, so they amount to like have spinless um, uh, fermions. Um, and he, here you, ca you can see that um, the, the, the simulations which, which are, have been reported in, in the li literature, they operate at a few billion basis states. And now you could ask, so what, what's the difference? Why, why are we able to do like 500 billions for spin models, but only say a few billions for, for the fraction quantum Hall effect here? And, and the reason is basically that although bo in both problems the, the Hamiltonian is formally sparse, which means it, it does not have an exponential number of, of elements, so the, the ratio of number of elements per the length of a column or a, a row is... is um, is really going to zero, still the number of, of operations is, can be quite different. As we will see later, like if you have a, um, a spin model with some really local interactions, like a nearest neighbor a coupling, then the number of matrix elements per, per basis state somehow is proportional to the number of bonds. That's basically where an action can happen. And so number of bonds is proportional to the number of sites, so it's, it's kind of linear in the number of sites. But if you, if you um, um, actually look how a Hamiltonian diffraction quantum Hall effect looks like, it's actually more like a four fermion interactions, which means there are, you, you, you will annihilate two fermions at some locations, and you will pack, put back two fermions uh, possibly somewhere else. And this is an object which has four indices, because there are two, two incoming kind of momenta or orbital, and two outgoing ones. And since there is only one overall momentum conservation, you be, um, the, the number of terms which are possibly non-zero scale is like the third power 
of the number of sides. And so the, the, one of the reasons then is, is that the, the number of matrix elements you have to process is, is much larger per basis state here than it is here. And, and since processing matrix elements is like the, the, the core ingredient of an exact diagonalization code, like the more matrix elements you have, the heavier the calculation gets, even though the memory you require might still be small, uh, the amount of work you have to do in order to calculate matrix elements um, uh, becomes larger. And, and then computing time becomes a limiting factor. So, so here it's not so much the, the memory of the Lanzer's vectors which limits you, it's more the computing time because it, the calculations get, get heavier because here they basically scale like with, with the third power of the number of orbitals where here the number of matrices on, only scale linear with the number of lattice sites. So yeah? No, I, I will talk about that also later. But in these cutting edge apl applications, you, you do not store the matrix. Um, and, um, and so what you gain, obviously, is that you don't waste memory. So you're not limited by memory because you're not storing it. But then in each iteration, you have to calculate the matrix elements anew. Um, and that costs, obviously, computing time. But, but it, it's clear that in, I mean, if, if you're working on a, on a large machine, you, you simply cannot afford to to store the matrix, otherwise your calculation becomes impossible. Whereas here it becomes possible, but it takes a long, it takes a long time. And so if you're interested in, in, in diagonalizing smaller problems where your, your Hamiltonian actually fits on, on in, in memory using uh, some of these sparse arrays, for example, as Chris and perhaps others ha have explained to you, if you can do that, obviously that's a good choice to actually store the matrix because then the matrix ve vector multiplication becomes very cheap. You don't have to do um, lookups and, and things like we will discuss later. You, you have stored your matrix once and for all, and then, then it's obviously much quicker to just use the stored matrix. But if you want to go really to, to, to large systems, then you have to think about about, um, strategies to somehow get your your largest problem done, and then it, it, it's actually more more promising to not store the matrix, but to, to recalculate it each time. But however, invest in parallelization schemes where you use a, a large number of processors or cores in order to to get this to calculate these matrix elements efficiently. <coughs> and then um, with, with Hubbard models which is roughly corresponds, uh, as I said, to, to full CI in quantum chemistry. Um, there, the, the, the number of sites range is like in the low 20s. So there are re reports of square lattice calculations with um, using 20 sites. Um, 20 sites, 21 sites triangular lattice uh, have been um, reported. And also 20, and one sector of a 24 site honeycomb lattice. So these, these calculations, again, are are um, at, at half filling, all of them, which means there are as many particles as there are lattice sites. And in addition, the, the, the spin is also SC equals to zero. That's, that's the sector where the Hubbard model has the largest Hilbert space um, per, uh, for a fixed system size. And, he, and here, the, the, um, the Hilbert space size is like co comparable to here, let's say. So this is like roughly 200 billion basis states. And, but all the, these reported calculations are already like 10 years old. So if, if one probably gives a new shot these days, one could probably go to like 10 to the 12 or even a, a bit larger. Because the, the Hubbard model somehow ha, has a, an interesting factorization property of the Hilbert space, because you, you can write down the Hilbert space as a product of, of all the configurations of the up spins, of the up fermions, the configurations of the downs, and there are no constraints. So then the, the, ten, the Hilbert space is really a tensor product of these two uh, kind of spin-like Hilbert spaces. And then um, yeah. this actually simplifies um, the organization of some of the lookup tables and so on quite efficiently. So, so Hubbard models are actually, um, in that sense, um, uh, quite uh, fast to implement. I mean, to, to run, I mean. And so I, as I mentioned before, so the, these kind of, of numbers of, of Hilbert spaces, they really apply if you're interested in calculating low-lying eigenvalues. And this is not, you cannot calculate currently the full, the full energy spectrum, um, the entire spectrum, but only the low-lying states, either lying at the lower or the upper end of the spectrum in the respective uh, sector. Yeah, please? Yeah, I mean, this Hubbard, I, I don't know. I mean, in some of these here, I, I, was, I was involved. And so, say, like this, this, this calculation here with 48-site Kagome lattice, 
their one lunch launch iterations takes like between five and ten minutes, depending on, on exactly the machine it runs on. For example, it takes like like six or so minutes on um, um, on a blue chain with with like um, a few a few thousand cores. So, um, so, so I mean, they really require large machines. But if you do that efficiently, then one Lanzos vector iteration takes takes a few minutes, like five, as I said, five to ten minutes. Which means that an actual run to up to convergence in that sector requires, perhaps, depending on the structure of the energy spectrum, perhaps a few hundred iterations, two, three hundred. Which means that in a day or so, um, like wall clock time, you you have a result. So. So the, the exact organization, typically, they, they require a lot of resources to, to actually get the calculation done. But, um, but then the time to, to solution is kind of reasonable, which means that the overall amount of computing time is not, not necessarily larger than what, what people do in Quantum Monte Carlo. I mean, Quantum Monte Carlo typically runs forever, and you, you stop when you're, you're satisfied with your error bars. But I think in, in terms of computing time, these are also substantial. You use substantial amount of computing time, but you're not forced to actually use like um, whatever hundreds or f uh, forty terabytes at once. And that is different here. You really need to have these resources at once, otherwise your your simulation is not able to proceed. Yes. When you say uh, a few low lying states, how many in roughly ten, hundred? No, no more like a, a few really means a handful. Um, so yes, for example, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, typically you can, if you just want to have a, a, a gross idea, you typically go for the for the lowest one, which you really converge, and then that one is, is converged to machine precision. But the, the rest of the spectrum has already uh, converged um, um, somewhat, so you already get an optical idea of, of what the spectrum looks like. But if you really want the other eigenvalues to converge, then of course you have to iterate longer, and then they will also converge further and further. And then you, but then you might need like two or three or four times more iterations than just go to go for the ground state. But if you really want to go high up, then it, bec it becomes challenging because, as we will talk about later, then some of these linear algebra techniques have some challenges if you really want to calculate a lot of eigenvalues. And, and you, you run into orthogonality loss issues and so on. And then, then the scaling of, of the algorithms slows down. <clears throat> OK. So that was kind of a bit of the overview or the, the motivation, what you can do and, and how, how much you can do. And, uh, and now I would like to, to dive into the a bit more technical part, where I would like to to present you what I consider to be a, the structure of, of such an exact diagonalization code. Um, and then we'll talk about the different um, in ingredients. <clears throat> so there are basically four different parts. So the first is actually you need to formulate your problem. And this, the first step means to actually uh, present uh, and describe the Hilbert space in a, in a computationally efficient way. <clears throat> so here we will talk about issues like the, the basis representation. I mean, how do I actually present basis states on my computer? Um, and something which is very important are, are so-called uh, lookup techniques. We will talk about that in more detail. The, the, the basic question you can have in mind is that um, um, consider that you write down a, um, the, a list of all the basis states which, which have, for example, a given AC, a total number of, or a total number of particles for some hardcore boson system. Um, if you list all these basis states, then, um, then that's a list and you can sort that, that even if you want. But later, if you act with your Hamiltonian on, on one of these states, for example, you, you're, you will be flipping um, uh, bits. So the new configuration you get has some other um, configuration of bits. And, and what I call, call lookup is basically the, 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 the task of giving a configuration which has been generated by application of Hamiltonian elements. You have a new configuration, and you would actually like to figure out where it actually is situated in the list of all the configurations. And that's, that basically amounts 
figuring out what is the index of your matrix elements in the big Hamiltonian matrix, like of the many body matrix, where is the index? Like you start in one configuration, so you know where you are, but you would like, so then you can calculate the matrix element, so you know the amplitude, but then you actually need to know where, where kind of the column or the row is situated, and that's what I call a lookup. So you would like to know where that element is, and, and in your in huge lists, it become a, can become a problem that searching for that can become expensive. So we have to think about speeding up this task. <clears throat> and especially in these um, sparse, I mean, these um, matrix-free techniques where you don't store the Hamiltonian, uh, you need to do that in each iteration again. And therefore, it, it, it's important that you invest some time in, in finding good solutions. If you're do, dealing with smaller problems where you calculate the matrix once and then you store it in a sparse matrix format, it's not that important that your ha Hamiltonian matrix um, calculation is really efficient. I mean, it can be a bit slower because you do it once and then for the other iterations you do it using using the stored matrix, then it's not that important. But if you want to do cutting edge um, applications, you, you need to worry about this. <clears throat> and then when, when it comes to, to Hilbert space, also symmetries will, will be important. So I, I mentioned some of these, like the AC symmetry. That's a simple one to implement. But then we, we also, um, in many applications, we, we actually have um, lattice symmetries, so, so discrete translations or discrete rotations. And we have to think about how to, how, how to implement that um, in order to, <coughs> to block diagonalize our Hamiltonian so that the block becomes substantially smaller. <coughs> then there is the the Hamiltonian matrix part. So um, that, that's his issue about whether you use, use, um, calculate the matrix to store it on, um, in memory or sometimes on disk, or whether you, you calculate it on the fly um, in this matrix-free ver version. <clears throat> and you also have to worry, basically, in the Hamiltonian part, you also have to worry in what, how, what are the expressions for the actual matrix elements. And if you use spatial symmetries, to, to sim um, then the matrix elements get slightly more complicated. But, but I will t tell you how, this how the form of the matrix element looks like. And then actually only now, now that we basically have a, a representation of our Hilbert space, and then in that Hilbert space a, a form for our Hamiltonian or a, or a way to calculate it efficiently, only then comes the, the linear algebra part in the, basically the, the Eigen solver or for other purposes also time propagation, which is really the core linear algebra part. But as you can see, it's only, it's only one aspect. It's not, it's not everything. <coughs> Uh, then obviously, if you want to calculate the entire spectrum, you can resort using some some um, libraries like LAPAC or MKL or or, or, um, or related um, vendor libraries, which which just do the job and do full diagonalization. Or you can use ScalaPAC or something like that to do that uh, distributed, and then you can calculate a full spectra of um, a few ten thousand up to perhaps a few hundred thousand in in uh, linear dimensions. That's about what you can do for full diagonalization, and um, However, if you're interested in the in, um, in only low-lying eigenvalues, you can use this land source type diagonalization, and um, and we will talk about that algorithm and and its advantages and and inconveniences later on. <coughs> um, but what is also interesting is that you you can replace these um, these solvers so. If, if you, for example, if you're interested in calculating several low-lying eigenstates and you also want to resolve the degeneracies of eigenstates, um, then perhaps a simple Lanzos algorithm in, in the basic formulation is not enough. And then you want to switch to something else, for perhaps a, a block Lanzos technique, which is able to resolve degeneracies, or you use a, um, an, an, a Davidson um, algorithm, a Jacobi Davidson, then you can simply re replace this part here and you, you not use the land source, but some other back end, and, uh, but you still can rely on your Hamiltonian representations, which, which we kind of established in the first part. <coughs> Something which is particularly nice about the, the land source algorithm, as we will discuss later, is that it actually o only re requires a basic operations of the type um, give, give, um, give a vector u, which is a, u is a vector in the Hilbert space, which has been obtained previously. 
And then uh, the only operation which a Lanthorst algorithm requires from you is basically apply H, so the matrix, uh, the Hamiltonian matrix onto U, and give back the result V. Which, which is, that's interesting because um, it's actually up to you how you organize this matrix vector multiplication, and the Lanthorst algorithm is not interested in actually peaking for, for um, particular matrix elements, so it's not working on the individual matrix elements of the matrix, but it's just, um, it's just interested in what is the, the action of, um, of the Hamiltonian onto some vector which the Lanthorst process gives you. You have to apply H onto it and give back the results, and, and that's how it works. So, so kind of the Lanthorst algorithm only wants to know what is the result of H applied to a vector, and is not interested in individual addressing individual matrix elements and doing something with them. So, so you can really hide all your Hilbert space and all your matrix in just one matrix vector multiplication operation, which is, is all what the Lanthorst algorithm wants to see. <coughs> and then say, if once you, you actually have calculated energies or, or also eigenfunctions, you, you can do both with this, with this method. Uh, then you also have to think about um, observables. What do you do with, with this? Um, and then you can, you can calculate a lot of, of um, static quantities, for example, correlation functions. You can even do multipoint correlation functions, correlation density matrix, or, or other, other um, more complicated uh, observers, also like reduced density matrices. Then you, you can also uh, calculate dynamic observables, um, so frequency resolved spectral functions, and density of states. And also something which is interesting, which I will also tell you a little bit about, is, an, is a real-time evolution. So that, that's basically the, what, what I think is, um, is the basic structure, the ingredients to, in order to have um, um, a versatile um, exact organization uh, framework. And, and we'll now talk about the different parts in the, in the rest of the, the morning um, in so we will now start looking into the, the Hilbert space. <coughs> Are there questions so far? As I mentioned before, the, the states of your Hilbert space need to be um, represented um, in the computer in some way. <clears throat> and so a, a guideline or a rule of thumb is that you, you should choose a representation of your, of your um, Hilbert space, which makes it simple to act with the Hamiltonian or other operators on the states, and also to find them, so to localize means to find them, the given state in the, in the basis of which, you're, which you're considering. <coughs> And so one, one example um, is basically um, if you have a, an ensemble of spin one half sites, it, it's just to resort to, to so-called binary coding, which means that you here you have a, a four spin a configuration of a chain or of a, of a two by two square lattice or whatever. And so here you have a, a fox state of your, of your spin chain. And then you translate that by, by choosing a convention that spin ups are represented as, as bits um, set, so a one whereas the spin down is a bit which is not set. And so um, you simply translate that into, into a binary representation. So that, that's why this subscript 2 means this is a binary number. And if you write that as a decimal number, this should give 13, if you're not mistaken. So which basically means if, if you have a register or a variable on your computer which, with, um, with the integer 13 in it, if you interpret that as a bit pattern, it basically tells you that this is a basis state or is, is a state of four spins which has, has, um, has this configuration. And, and what is nice is that in some of the, of the programming languages, like C++ or also, also many others, you, you can actually do efficient um, operations on such bit fields. For example, you, you can test whether a bit is set or not using simple, simple techniques. Um, and for example, in, in some of the spin models, you, you have um, um, a spin exchange, and, an XY type um, spin interaction where, where S plus acts on, um, here the indices are missing unfortunately, but say S plus is like um, acting on, on site, um, 
on some side here and this minus on another one and, and here uh, minus and plus work I mean, work on a pair of, of spins and what is now nice is that you um, say you here we have um, we have this configuration which you have written down um, and now we would like to, to flip uh, two spins then the question is how, how can we do that um, so the idea is basically to, to take to prepare a, a mask um, like here, where you basically put two ones at, at the locations where the, the, the two spins are, where, which you want to, to, uh, to exchange, where you want to do a, 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 um, a spin hop, a flip of both um, spins. So, so here, this mask is chosen such that we're, we're talking about the two, the two central spins. So these are that one and that one. And now, if, you're, if you want to do that in general, what you have to do first, basically, is to, um, to, uh, to take this mask and then to, to apply it on, on, um, on this bit pattern. And then you have to first figure out whether, whether the two spins which you are considering, whether they are actually in a flippable state, which means um, of the two sides which you're looking at, only one spin can be set and the other one has to be, uh, has, has to be not set. Otherwise, um, the um, uh, configuration is not flippable, which means if two spins are up or both spins are down, there's nothing to flip. So, so then you, you cannot do something. But here, here, this spin one and zero, they are in a flippable configuration with respect to each other. And now what is interesting here is that you, you can take this bit mask and use a, a so-called exclusive OR operation um, that way, where all the sides which are not, not involved, they have a zero here. And all the other ones, um, the, the two which are involved, have a one. And if you apply that, um, this uh, binary operation here, you actually get the result where the two, the two spins here are flipped, whereas all the other co um, spins are, are left um, intact. And so for those who are not familiar with this exclusive OR operation, the exclusive OR operation is a, is a binary operation which, um, which gives you a one as output if the, the two inputs are different, and it gives you a zero if the two inputs are the same. <clears throat> which means here, for example, so you, you do it, um, um, you see the XOR uh, works by, uh, bitwise. So here you have a one, you have a zero. The XOR of the first bit there, therefore gives you a one because they are different. Then that one with that one, the two are the same. XOR gives you a zero, so there's a zero coming out. Here there's a zero and a one, they are different. So XOR gives you a one. And here that one and that zero gives you a one as well because again they are different. And if you think about that, if you have a zero here, <coughs> If you have a zero here, this basically just replicates what you had as an input, whereas if you have a one, you basically flip what you have as an input. And so, so, um, so if you do that, if you do it that way, you, you can kind of um, flip flip spins very easily, and that's that typically how you can implement such a spin flip operation on a on a binary level. Because, like for example, that there is a there is an operation. Um, using exclusive or even in, in C or C++, there is such a binary operation, which is basically the, the hat operation. don't know whether you have encountered that, but that's part of the C language to do exclusive or um, bit operations. Um, and so if you so this was a simple example telling you how you could do that for spin one half. But obviously, if you're working um, in a different regime, you might also think um, like um, writing down your basis differently. So if you have, um, so this representation here is, is quite efficient if you're actually thinking about the system which has roughly the same number of up and down spins. Because then the, the Hilbert space grows so rapidly that typically you're, you're not working on, on systems which are larger than, say, 64 sites. And 64 sites then translates into 64 bits. And that's basically the, the size of a register or of, of a variable of a long integer which you have on current machines. So you can really work with the basic data types of your, of your computer, which is very fast. However, if you're interested in, in a different regime where basically you have only a few particles, say a handful of particles, but on, on lattices with, with hundreds of sites, like 100 or perhaps 200 sites, th then you might wonder 
whether this is still the right way to do it. And indeed, then if you only have a few particles, then perhaps you, you're better off actually describing your basis states as, a, as a, a list, basically, where you say where, you say where the, the locations of your four particles are. So in that, in that regime, it might not be the best way to actually use 200 bits and tell where the, where the, the sites are, but actually to, to, to just tell for the, for the number of particles which you consider what the location is of, of, the, of the particle on your, on your lattice. And then, then, of course, you have to, to, um, to do these hoppings uh, to implement them differently. But if you're interested in this kind of uh, low magnetization um, applications, which, are, which is the typical, I mean, uh, the, the most encountered um, application, then this is um, the most efficient way to do it, I guess. <clears throat> then if you're, if you're thinking about the spin one, then the spin one obviously has three different local basis states, uh, spin up, zero, or spin, spin down. And then um, it's, it's obvious that one bit is not sufficient to encode um, information about three different states. <clears throat> um, and so the, here there are actually two different choices. You can actually use something like a, a ternary representation. So basically, you, you, you tr treat your integer um, basically as a number uh, with the basis uh, three. Which means you do more like modulo and, and divide operations with three in order to figure out basically what is the digit of your of your number in the basis three representation. So the, the three digits zero, one, and two basically are then mapped onto onto down zero and up or something like that. Um, and so you can you can organize that. Or also if you you can, but what what you can also do is kind of blow blow up the representation and simply use two bits, two consecutive bits. They can actually store four states, but you only lose three of them. Where basically, you say that every two bits uh, encodes the state of one spin one uh, state, and that's another way to go. And and um, I think it's not it's not clear which one is faster, but but it's clear that the ternary representation is more compact, so it uses less bits overall. Whereas here you're, you're wasting kind of one state per per um, per two bits, but sometimes you can you can afford to do that. <clears throat> and you, you can again th think about, um, like for spin one, although I have not sh shown you, but, but for spin one, what one can typically do if you're considering a spin, uh, an SU2 invariant model, for spin ones, you can typically go to system sizes of, um, of perhaps 20, 25 sites, something in between there. Um, and so if you again have a reference that, that your typical integers you deal with have 64 bits, and here, here you, you use two bits per, to represent the site, a site with 64 bits. You can therefore represent basically 32 spin ones, and that's still enough for, for the, the applications which work in this kind of zero magnetization um, um, regime. So, so this, this is perfectly fine to represent uh, the states of a spin one with two bits. And then obviously spin three half can also fit into two bits, and then you, you obviously you have to increase uh, for spin two, and higher you have to use three bits and so on. Are there questions for that? <clears throat> and then there are there are a few other models where one has interesting um, uh, ways to, to uh, arrange the, um, the Hilbert space. So if, if you first think about the TJ model, I don't know whether you're familiar with the TJ model. The T TJ model is, is, um, is a model where you also have three basis states, and they are basically, um, so in the TJ model, you have three basis states. You either have an, app, have an empty site, so there's no particle on it, or you, you have a spin up, or you have a, have a spin down. Um, and the difference with the, with the spin one, which I just talked about, is that this is basically um, a, a fermion, a fermion with a spin up, and this is also a fermion, so the, the kind of the physical um, picture behind it is different. So this is an empty site, there's no particle. Here there's a spin up fermion, here there's a, a spin down fermion, and you obtain a TJ model by, basically by, by starting from a Hubbard model, where you also would have the, the W occupied site, but you, you delete that one because you're interested in a large U regime, but U is the double 
penalizes um, doubly occupied sites. And if something is really um, suppressed by energy a lot, you can, you can actually um, throw it out of your Hilbert space. And so you can reduce the Hubbard model to a TJ model. But in a, in a TJ model, the, the, the number of, um, of zeros or, or the number of ups and downs together is separately conserved, which is not the case in a spin one model. So the symmetries are slightly different because re here you really have um, SC conservation um, um, in, a, in a typical TJ model, but you also have charge conservation, which means that um, this is an empty site and these are sites which carry um, are, are states which carry a charge, and this is conserved in the TJ model, so you, you can organize your Hilbert space slightly different. And so if you're interested in a TJ model um, at low doping, um, you can actually write down a many-body state basically um, in a factorized way where you, you, you first um, tell basically the, um, in your configuration, you, you have two different bit um, patterns. One is basically to tell you where the holes are, so you indicate basically by bits where the zeros are, whereas here you, on the remaining bits, you, you actually encode the state of the spins. So let, let me show, make an example so that you, you understand what I mean, is that um, if we write down a, um, basically a configuration of, um, of a TJ model, so we have like a, a spin up, then we have a down spin, um, then we have um, something like that, then <coughs> um, now, for example, we can choose the convention. So that, that's a TJ configuration. And then we, we first have a, we now decompose that into two different bit patterns, um, which basically means first I tell where the charge is, which means now I, I only use the information in that charge pattern, um, whether there's a charge at a certain site or not, which means here there is a charge. I mean, there's a particle with, with spin up or down. So every, everything there's an up or a down, I trans, translate that into a one. Whereas if there's an empty site, I, I put the zero. So, so in the charge sense, this maps onto, onto this. Because each one there is a one, there was a particle. And then what I do basically is then here. And here I have a, a shorter, a shorter um, um, cat. And here I basically um, write down the occupation of the, of the, I mean, on those sites where there is a charge, I now indicate the spin, the spin uh, configuration, which means now, since I, uh, on those six sites, I only have four charges, I'm only left to indicate the four spin states of the four charges. And now on the first charge, the first particle, I have a spin up, so I will put the one, then I have two downs, so there will be zero, zero, and then there's an up again, so there's another one here. And now you, you can ask, um, why did I do that? So the, the idea is basically that in a, if you think about a TJ Hamiltonian, so for those of you who don't know how a TJ Hamiltonian looks like, that, that's basically a, a sum over lattice bonds. And then there's a, a hopping of this um, There's some, some hopping. Um, the kinetic energy of the particles with the, with the spin also. So that's it. Particles like this, they, they can hop. Um, but there's also some... Um, there's also some... For two neighboring sites where, we, where there are two spins, where both, on both sides there are particles with the spin there, there's actually a Heisenberg interactions acting between those two um, uh, neighboring um, sites. However, if one on one of the sides there is no charge, then obviously this is, uh, doesn't have an action. And so if you think about what's, what these different terms in your Hamiltonian do, then, then you can see that the charge part here is, is basically just um, hopping a spin from that to that location. And then you can see, for example, that what is then nice in this language is that if you're only considering the action of a hop term, then what it will do in the TJ model, it will hop, it will exchange these two, but we'll, what will happen on the level of this um, representation in separated in charge and spin is that he, here you just um, you, you exchange these two because now the charge hops from that plot, uh, side to this one. But it, what is interesting is that the, the spin configuration is now not affected because in that this this still has the meaning that these these are the four positions so the position of that charge change it change but the configuration of the spin sitting on top of the charges has not, has not changed 
So there's some advantage that you, you don't you have to do less operations um, for the for the charge part here, and that that is um it is of some interest. <coughs> And the, the reason is also that that um, after that you you can or also organize your your um, your, your lookup tables in a, in kind of a almost factorized way, which somehow means that your the individual tables you you have to you have to um, create are are smaller than and if you if you use um, configurations where on each side you actually to, uh, use two bits to represent uh, this, the, the, the the state of one of these three different uh, local basis states. Okay. Um, and for Hubbard models, one, one can actually, um, as I mentioned before already, one can actually factorize the Hilbert space in up and down electron configurations, and then um, that's also helpful to represent the basis. So not not to use uh, two bits uh, sequentially, but actually write down a configuration in look where are the up, I mean where are the up spins and where are the down spins, and then then can be uh, fa faster and uses less memory to actually represent the Hilbert space that way. <coughs> um, then, um, so if you have tensor product um, Hilbert spaces like the cases we looked at before, it's rather simple how to how to construct the different basis states. But if you have um, if you have a constraint model, such as quantum dimer models, um, then it is actually um, it's a non-trivial problem to actually generate all all the all dimer coverings. And um, so, on the one hand, you have an advantage that typically dimer models have Hilbert spaces which um, per lattice sites uh, grow rather slowly. They're still exponential, but somehow they're, they're, uh, they're, the the way they they diverge is, is less is less violent than in other models. But on the other hand. Um, uh, actually, finding all dimer coverings for like a lattice with of, or, of order hundred sites um, really requires you to think about how to to find these dimer coverings efficiently. Because if you're doing that the wrong way, basically, for example, taking every lattice sites and trying all f all four different lo local orientations of the dimer emanating from one site and then finding matching that way, then it can very well be that your your algorithm is extremely slow and you, you you're not able to really find find all of them in in a in finite amount of time. So you really have to think using perhaps backtracking techniques or other clever uh, techniques in, or, um, in order to find, find these dimer coverings efficiently. But it's just a, an input that basically uh, if something is simple for tensor product um, Hilbert space, it doesn't mean that, that um, for the constraint model is, it is as simple. Sometimes you have to work a bit in order to generate Hilbert spaces efficiently. And that, that's, um, that, that's an additional challenge for these constraint models. And um, so one of the key challenges, because if, if you're recalculating the matrix elements each time in each uh, land source vector iteration um, anew, is, is, um, is to find the index of a new configuration in the list of all the configurations that you have. That's what I, I briefly explained before. It's basically figuring out the index F, like for final state, of a matrix element which connects your initial state, which you know, you, you know I, typically, then you apply a matrix element and you find a new configuration. Then you would like to know to what, what configuration, um, to what F does this con configuration um, correspond. And let us now look, look at that in the context of a, of a simple spin a half chain at, at fixed um, SC. So actually, we now encounter the example again, which we used before. So before we had um, the number 13 in decimal representation, which was 1, 1, 0, 1. And then we, we flipped it. We, we flipped the two central spins. And now that, that's our, our new configuration. So th that's this bit pattern. And, um, and the question is, is now, um, basically, how, how, do I, how do I find um, the index of that of that state, and in order to illustrate this, I mean, if you um, if you enumerate your Hilbert space and you do that in a in a numerically increasing way, then you would actually write your, your four configurations in that Hilbert space because we are we're considering four sites, 
and we're basically having total SC of, of one. That's, you have three up and one down pointing spin, so that's total SC of one. And so um, in terms of spin configurations, you, you can basically choose where, where the down pointing spin is, like that. And, and so there are four different choices. So the, and they then translate into bit patterns. So there's like a zero because the first one is, is down, like this one. Um, and now you can see there, there are arithmetically increasing because the, that's the most significant bit, so that gives you the largest um, like a number. So that's the, the smallest one, and the next, and the next, and the next. But now you can see that if you actually number these states in your Hilbert space, you would say that this is state number zero, because in, in, you typically start numbering items by with starting with zero. So this is the configuration which has index one, that's two, and that's, that's three. But now you see the, the, the basic problem I want to expose is that that this bit pattern one zero one one. Um, if you look in the list here, you, you can see it's actually the state with index one in our list. But if you if you, the, the register or the, the variable we have has as an entry as as a value which is eleven in the decibel number. So there's a mismatch between if you just look at the pattern, it has a value. It's a number, but the number does not is not its position in the list of all the configurations. So the basic basic problem we have is that how, how do I find out efficiently um, kind of what is the index of this configuration in the list of my of my states here in the example of a of a Hilbert space with a fixed um, AC. Uh, and you see that the AC constraint actually on the one hand, it, it reduces our Hilbert space because instead of, of 16 spins, <coughs> um, which we have for a, for a general foresight sp uh, spin, if you impose an SE constraint, we, we reduce our Hilbert space, but then we, we lose the mapping between the, the value of a spin configuration in, as a numerical, uh, as a number, uh, with its index in the list of configurations. Be because if you, if you drop the SE constraint, if you really uh, basically um, consider a spin configuration to be to be a number that way, but you allow all spin configurations, then the value of the configuration is its index if you order the configurations um, increasingly. But however, if you take a projection, project to a fixed number of, of, um, of spins, of spin ups, for example, which means having a, a conserved SE, uh, then basically you, you realize that the number which a, a configuration represents is not equal to its index, and now you have to think about other techniques in order to kind of speed up that mapping. <clears throat> and now the, the, the basic technique I, I would like to, to show you, because it's actually a, a curious um, aspect, is our, our so-called um, lin tables. So HQ Lin introduced that in a paper in the early early 90s. Um, and so what, what these, these Lin tables do is, um, is again to, to map from this, the binary number, like here this value 11, to the index in list of allowed states. And actually the idea behind it, I tried to explain you a little bit what the idea behind this, is that this idea then actually works for arbitrary number of additive uh, quantum numbers. So the additive quantum number in the game here is the SC conservation. And, and the part which is additive is that, that the SC quantum number um, can actually be obtained by summing local contributions up to the, to the end, like going through all sides. You add up the SC and then you have a global, a global additive uh, quantum number. But you, you can obtain it by, by, by having a contribution like from a left and the right part. And that's actually Im important because um, this allows you now to, to, to look at two different, to construct two different tables where um, you have two tables which um, have a size of 2 to the n uh, divided by 2, which is actually square root of 2 to the n. I mean, it's obvious, but, but this might illustrate better what you have in mind. Um, and, uh, and one table are for the most significant bits and another table for the least significant bits. So the most significant bits basically means are the, are the two larger, the two bits which in binary representation gives you the larger numbers and the least significant bits are the other two. And in order to fully appreciate what that means is that if you're thinking about um, 
Now, not the foresight example as you do here, which is really a cartoon uh, problem, but if you have something like 20 spins, so 20 spins, the, the overall Hilbert space is like a, is a million. It's 2 to the 20 is roughly a million. Um, and so in principle, you, you can store your entire Hilbert space as a, um, I mean, for all spin configurations, you can basically um, um, have, a, have a table. You, you go as an index with this number 11 in it, and you actually store the index. That would be one way to do, to really somehow have a list with the indices. But that's a bit expensive. And... Um, and with this technique here, you can actually write, um, use two tables, where each table only uses square root um, um, entries, which means that um, instead of having one table which has a size of a million, we actually has, have two tables with a size of a thousand. And here you, you can see there's a big difference um, affording two tables with square root 2 to the n, so a thousand, um, is, is much more convenient and doesn't use a lot of memory compared to having a table with, with, um, with a million um, entries. So you see that the square root is actually really important. <clears throat> and now the, the trick here is um, you can see there are now two tables and initially um, I just present them you in, in a kind of a magic way. So there is one table here, the, the orange one, which has it now has only two bits long because we have four bits initially. Square root of n actually makes that you only consider half the number of bits. So these are two. And then, um, so th these are the, the, the four entries in our table. So the values range from 0 to 3. But here they're written in a binary language. And, um, and these are now tables which, um, which we can use to, to figure out the index of this, of this and other configurations. But they all have to come from the same uh, global um, constraint sector. Namely, they all have to have S overall SC equals 1. And now, magically, if you take this table, this yellow one, where 0, 0 actually does not occur, so the value here is not important, therefore I put an x. But then I have a configuration 0, 1, I give it the value 0. I have a configuration 1, 0 on the first two bits, I give that the value 1. And then I have a configuration 1, 1, and I give that the value 2. So t take that just for granted for a moment. And then you have um, another table which is relevant for the least significant bits, so for the second half of the bits. So 0, 0 again does not occur, so I, I, I don't have to specify the value not important, but then I have 0, 1 equals 0, 1, 0 equals 1, and 1, 1 equals 0. And now the magic is, is that these two tables, they are now ready to, to actually give you the correct um, index in the, in the list of ordered states for, for any input which is a valid configuration in that subspace. And if you take our example, so 1, 0, 1, 1 is a valid configuration in this C equals 1 state. So we break it apart. So we take the first two bits, 1, 0, they are the most significant bits. We take them 1, 0, so that, that's the number 2, basically. Um, so we corresponding to the third index, because we start numbering at, at, um, at 0. So here we, put, we go with this 1, 0 into the, in this table with, in, with this index. You get back an answer 1. So that's actually this case here. So we, we write down a 1. That's a result from the first lookup here. And then we take the other two bits, 1, 1, which are the, the least significant bits. We go into that list here, which is relevant for the least significant bits. And we get an answer 0. And so we add them up, and we get 1. And now here you can actually see here um, all four basis states, which are in that sector, are tested using that way. So we have 0, 1, 1, 1. So 0, 1 gives you 0 from here. 1, 1 in that table gives you 0 here. So that gives you overall 0. It, it reproduces correctly. That's the... This 0, 1, 1, 1 is the first state in our list. That's fine. And, and you, can, you can see that all the other ones, this 1, 1, it gives you um, 2 here. And that, for that configuration, also gives you a 2. So they, they have the same because they, they have the same most significant bits. So that 0, 1 gives you a 0. And that 1, 1 gives you, um, sorry, that 1, 0 gives you a 1. So this adds up to 3. And so now you, you can ask, well, what's the magic in that? Is that just a coincidence, or what's the, the logic behind? The, the, the logic is basically that if you have um, a configuration of, of that kind, then actually um, there is a, um, an AC on the, on the, on the most significant part uh, bits, and there's also an, a corresponding AC on the least significant bits, and the two ACs which these sub, sub parts have, they have to add up to, to, to satisfy the global constraint, which means there has to be some AC on the first two bits and some AC on the, on the second two bits, and to, together they have to add up to the, um, 
to the correct overall SC which you want to impose, or you can also call it particle number, it's the same, but the, the idea is the same. And then the, the idea is basically that, that the, um, the most significant bits, they also, they, they, here they, they also correspond here, so for example, this is a sector with zero particles on the first two bits, with one particle, with one particle, and with two particles, and on the other hand here you have, um, you have the sector with, with zero particles, with one, zero, one, and with, with two particles. And, and at least it's, it's simple to understand what this least significant bit part is doing is basically, um, you, you can write down the table for the least significant bits very easily because um, you're going through all configurations which are possible on, um, on your subsystem, on, the, on this half of the bits, and basically you number, you number the states according to their position um, within the subspace of that subsystem, which means, um, so here basically zero, zero would mean you could, you could actually put the zero because it's the first state which only has two bit, which has zero particles. So zero, one is actually the first state which has one particle, so you put the zero, and one zero is the st second state with one particle, so it has a one. And, and one, one is the first state which has, um, which has um, uh, two particles, so it has a zero again. And so if, if, you, if you do that, for example, for three, just as an example, um, yeah. so, so can you help me how, how I fill up this, this uh, list here now? So these are the, this is the table for the least significant bits I want to, to fill in, and, and here I want to know what are the, the entries in my table. Zero, yes. 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 Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, okay, I, I guess you have understood the logic. Um, and now, um, that's, that's how you do for, for least significant bits. And now, what is the idea now on the most significant bits? So the, the, the most significant bits is slightly more, more complicated because uh, it, as you go through the, in, in, um, all the configurations allowed, um, you basically keep track of, of how many configurations you have already encountered by going through. But the idea is that basically if you... Um, yeah, yeah, so the, the idea is... Um, So say if, if you're in a, in a certain sector and you start with your most significant bits, say like you have um, you have um, zero zero here, but you say like you have two particles allowed and you have another three bits um, here. So you have another three bit, which basically means now if you're going um, um, or in an ordered way, first you have you have um, three different configurations here, which which actually have. Um, which have two particles, like these are um, this configuration, this one, and, and this one. So there are three configurations which we'll go through. But then as, when you encounter the first time, you increase the, the most significant bit by one. Now you actually have to put as an entry. Um, mm. So the entry for zero, zero, zero is because you start at zero is zero, but now you have to ask, given a global constraint of two particles, like how many, how many two particle states have, have I been able to do given that, that configuration for the most significant bits? Then there are basically, um, there are three configurations. So when I'm done here and I'm coming to, uh, I increase um, my most significant bits by, by one basically, then I have to, to add up how many configurations I have seen, I have cycled through on the, on the least significant part, which means here I have to put three. But now you have to see, now that I, I increase that to one, I have, 
pulled out one particle from here, so there's one particle here, but then on the, on the remaining three bits, there can only be one particle, and, and okay, f th there are three configurations with one particle possible, so I will go through them, um, and then once I'm going to 101 here for the most significant bit, I have gone through another three bits, uh, three states on the least significant side, and so I have to add them up, and then so this will be six here. Perhaps I illustrate that also by, by writing that out. So this is this is a list of all configurations which which can occur um, without any constraints on the most significant bits, and this is a list of all the configurations which can allow without without any constraints on the least significant bit. But now we have an overall constraints of say two particles, which basically mean if if we start here with with this zero zero zero, um, there is no particle here, so all particles have to come from that side, which basically means if we're here. Then, then basically we, 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 we can only look at this configuration, at that one, at that one. These are the three which occur. And now if you want to fill our table, so that's this one here. So for zero, 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 we start with, with zero. But if we fix that, now we will, we will take this configuration into account, that one and that one, and, and now we have it on all on the least significant side. And now if you have gone through them, we have to, inc to go to the next one on that side. But when we have done that, we can now fill our table. Because we have visited three configurations, we now go from 0 to 3 as the new entry in our table of this, look, of this lookup table. And so if we have 1 here, it basically means there's one particle here. And now there, are, there is one, um, there's only one particle here. So now, now we're basically visiting this configuration, that one, um, and, and that one. So it's another 3 here. So that, that's fine. <clears throat> so if, if we now uh, are gone through that, we have another, accumulated another three. So if, if we're visiting this configuration as a most significant one, we have added three. And th that's now why we're at six. <clears throat> and if we're now at this configuration, we have one particle. So we're visiting the same ones again. So we have to add another, another three when, when you get to zero, one, one. <clears throat> However, now, now, it's, um, now you see it, it, there will be a change because now we have all two particles on our first two bits and there's no particle left on the other side. So here we will only visit this one, otherwise we will not satisfy our global constraint. So there's only one state which we, which we pick in. So if you go to the next one, we have only increased by one. So here, one zero zero in, the, in this most significant lookup table, there will be ju just be written ten. Okay, and now you, you can continue. If you um, if you're here, you have one particle, so you're again uh, cycling here through the one particle states. So you add up another three. 13, and, and you con can go on and, and complete the table. But now, if you do that, that the way we say, um, and this is now the this is now the lookup table for the most significant bits, and here that's the lookup table for the least significant bits. So if if, um, if you have now these two, you can really take any configuration out of this product Hilbert space, which has the, which satisfy the global constraint of only have two particle. Then you can take the first three bits of your configuration, 
Um, and then this will give you a number here, which we have established. And then you add up that number with, with the, the number you get by, by putting the least significant bits in this table and, and adding up these numbers, and you get the correct index that way. <coughs> Yes? How do you go from index to the vector? Do you save them in the Yes. Yeah, when you construct the Hilbert space, um, yeah, I did not talk about that specifically, but when you construct the Hilbert space, you can, like, for example, go through all, spin, all possible spin configurations of a spin chain, and you check what is the AC of that configuration, and you only keep the ones which, which satisfy the constraint, and then typically you put them in a list, yeah. So you store all the integers. And so going from the index to the configuration is something which you have stored. <coughs> Pardon me? If you had an odd number, it, it just means that, that um, one of the lists has one bit less. So like if you have five sites, you can have three bits on the most significant two on the other one, or vice versa. It's not important. Uh, yeah. And actually, this is like this is the simplest setup now with conserved num with a, a single conserved number of particles. But you can actually also do that if your configurations have like spin have like a spin quantum number and a charge one or or things like that. You can still uh, write down the generalized um, uh, tables that way, like a left and the right part, and um, and they have a. Like the way how you construct it on this side is something is a, is still like summing up the contributions which which you have seen by building up your Hilbert space. So this is like an intermediate uh, sum which you which you come up. You, you see here they are monotonically increasing, whereas here they, it's still. Con um, what I mean is that you still have configurations in your least significant bits, but it, they can be have um, more quantum number sectors. Like it could be that the, this configuration has a spin and a charge, and then you would actually still go forward and and uh, enumerate configurations which are in, in the same same charge and in the same spin sector. You would number them continuously through, but but it might be that they appear scattered here because another configuration might be another charge or in another spin sector or in, in both sectors different, and then. They, they would have another count, but it's within the sector, within the same number of, of the same charge or the same spin on the subsystem. You you um, you index them continuously, so that's how you how you build the least significant bits, and the most significant bits is by actually accumulating um, the, the visited states as you go through your Hilbert space, and then your two tables are are perfectly consistent, and you. And then the main idea is that if you have a configuration, you break it up in two, you go into the left and the right table, you add up and you get the answer, and that's, that's quite efficient for these problems of, of just having conserved charges, and even if you have several of them. Which means, for example, you can also do SUN spin models, where you have, have more conserved kind of spin quantum numbers, and they, it, it works. Um, it's simple to generalize it, and it, it works the same way to break it up into two tables. <clears throat> yeah, so, so now, um, now if you have understood this, um, this concept of these lint tables, the lookup can now be done with just two direct memory reads because the two tables which you have constructed since they're only square root of, of Hilbert space large, they're typically uh, really small compared to your, to your overall Hilbert space dimension. So it's negligible to store them compared to storing a, a Lanz or vector, which is size of, Hil of the Hilbert space. <clears throat> and so th therefore this is a, a time and memory efficient approach. Time because it's only two direct memory access in, a, in an ordered vector, so that, that has constant access time, um, and so that's quite quite okay. Um, sometimes it, when it's not possible to actually build such a, to build such a, um, a table, like a, a, these lint tables, it's still possible to, to actually do a hash list or to do a binary search in the list of all configurations. So say if you're not, for some reason, you're not able to, to actually uh, construct these lint tables, you can still um, as we said before, there's a list of all configurations we, which we keep in our in our um, um, code, 
Um, and then if you generate a new configuration by applying a matrix uh, element in your Hamiltonian, uh, <clears throat> Either if you have a hash list, this gives you more or less constant access time. It tells you where that configuration is. You can build such a hash list. Or you can also, um, since your list of configuration, if it's ordered, you can do a binary search and then with a logarithmic time um, in, in, in units of the length of your, of your vector, you're able to locate it. And that's also sometimes still OK. <coughs> However, if, if you're using... Um, a spatial symmetries, that's not something we considered here. We, here we just considered like this diagonal uh, particle number conservation or a C conservation. Then building this lint table gets a bit more complicated, but I, I will not talk about this r right now in, in these combined um, um, uh, symmetries. Okay, so I think now it's, it's 10 o'clock. I think it's a good time to make, uh, to make the break. And after that, we will then start with, um, with the symmetries, looking into details about lattices and lattice symmetries and, and how, they, how they come into play in an exact organization code. Okay?